hip, hip, hooray for DNA. It provides the key to the plans for making everything in you and me. So far, we talked a lot about chromosomes and what chromosomes are and how they behave in mitosis and meiosis. So we said that chromosomes, for example, there's crossing over that occurs and there's independent sorbent that occurs from chromosomes in mitosis and meiosis. But I also said, I'm not sure if you remember, if not, that's fine. But if, I also said that if it's not mitosis and meiosis, so if the cell is not dividing, then it will actually be in this chromatin form, which is just the same thing. The, the DNA is still there, but it's just wound, it's wound up. So it's not in that condensed form anymore as a chromosome, but it's just unwound. And that's chromatin. And within that chromatin is where we find our genes, right? So it, our genes are just, you know, like this part might be a gene, this part might be a gene, this part might be a gene. So we find our genes in our chromatin and in our chromosomes. And what are genes? Well, genes were segments of DNA. So segments of DNA, so bits of our DNA, segments of DNA that code for something. F as for something. And what do they code for? Well, they code for polypeptides. So they help make polypeptides. And if you remember from the last video, we said that polypeptides help us make proteins. So there might be either there might be one polypeptide chain that makes a protein or a combination of polypeptide chains that make proteins. But ultimately, polypeptide chains help us make proteins. And why do we need proteins? Well, proteins are absolutely important. So proteins are in our skin, in our hair, in our muscle. All enzymes are proteins. A lot of hormones are proteins. Without proteins, we wouldn't be able to survive. And this is the idea of how we can go from genes to polypeptides, how that actually works. This is what we cover in this video. And how that works, how proteins actually get produced, is called the central dogma of biology. Central dogma of biology. And that just means that it's more or less what underpins biology. So you need to have a good grasp of this concept to be able to understand biology. So what I would recommend is watch this video, the next video, the next couple of videos, and try to really understand this idea of how polypeptides and how proteins get produced. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask questions. If, if, you, if I need to remake the video, I'll remake the video, uh, because this is a really important concept. This is basically the most important concept when it comes to biology, how proteins get produced. And this is what this dot point is all about. Outline using a simple model, the process by which DNA controls the production of polypeptides. So how DNA is responsible for making polypeptides. That's what we're going to cover in this video. And there's a couple of stages. There's two stages you should remember, transcription and translation. I'm going to go over transcription first. But what transcription means, it comes from the word transcribe. So it's basically, you know, you, you copy down. So you can imagine someone having a book and copying down that book in a so just writing the the same book again that's copying that's transcribing so you just copy it down so the first phase is called transcription and what happens with transcription you don't have to remember these different phases initiation elongation termination you don't even need to remember those phases but you should remember what happens here so here we have let's say this part of our segment is our gene so this part will code for a certain polypeptide so it codes for a polypeptide so what happens is we have this RNA polymerase, so it has an A as E in the end, which means it's an enzyme. This enzyme will come and open up the, the DNA. So it opens up the DNA, but it only opens up the DNA at the location where the gene is. Right? It wants to make a copy of the gene. It doesn't care about this stuff or this stuff. It just cares about the gene itself. So initiation means you know it's going to open up that area. So here you can see it's opened up. And what happens next is we call it elongation, which is when that same polymerase enzyme makes a mRNA copy. And I'm going to go over what mRNA is in a second. It's called M, stands for messenger, messenger RNA. And RNA is slightly different to DNA. So we have the word RNA, and you should know just that RNA is just some version of DNA. This is RNA, and this is DNA. And you can see that this DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And that just means that we have 
here we have a H and no oxygen. Right? So it's called deoxy. That D stands for deoxy, it means there's no oxygen. Whereas RNA has an oxygen. You can see here it has an oxygen. And there's a reason why, and we won't go over that now, but it's a reason why. But that's basically the only real difference between DNA and RNA. It's the the O which is in the sugar of RNA, and the O does not exist for DNA. Right? But it's a very similar molecule, but there's a slight difference. So here we have our RNA, which is making a copy. So this enzyme makes a copy of this part of the gene, and it does so by making a mRNA. And then after a while, once it's made the copy, there's termination, which means it just stops. And where does this ha transcription happen? Transcription happens here, which is inside the nucleus. So because DNA does not leave the nucleus, DNA does not need to leave the nucleus, so DNA will be transcribed in the nucleus. So this happens in the nucleus. And this is it. So this is what would happen. We have here, we have it opened up. So that was the initiation part. Then this enzyme comes in. I'm not going to draw the enzyme coming in, but this enzyme would come in, and it makes a copy. And for G, it copies, it makes a C. So G is copied with a C. And T is copied with a A. And it's the same complementary thing, but there's only one difference. When there's an A, it actually doesn't make a T, which it usually does, but it makes a U. Because the one big difference with RNA is that U is the same with RNA as T is for DNA. So U and T are alike. That means that A binds with U for RNA and T binds with A for DNA. Right, so this is DNA and this is RNA. That's the only difference you need to remember. Uracil is there in place of T. So now it's making K, it made A, it copied it a U because it didn't make a T for mRNA. And G, same thing, we'll make a C, C, we'll make a G, T, we'll make an A, C, we'll make a G, A, would we'll copy it as a U. Remember, there was no T, so when it has to copy the opposite of A, it will make a U, and a T will make an A. I just made a copy of it, a complementary copy. And let's say we, we don't use those red or blue colors, we use a light blue color. And this is our mRNA. And what we'll do now is it will travel out. It will go to the cytoplasm. All right, so this happened here. We have our mRNA, which is what I just did, a copy of it. And now it leaves the nucleus and goes into the ribosome. I'm going to show a quick animation of that process, and I'm going to move on to the next part. The cell transcribes the genetic designs for each protein from strands of DNA to special molecules of RNA. An enzyme unwinds a segment of DNA, making room for its complementary RNA nucleotides. Both DNA and RNA nucleotides contain a sugar, phosphate, and base. But in RNA, the sugar is ribose, and one of the four bases is replaced by uracil. The exposed bases of the DNA strand serve as a model for the construction of messenger, or mRNA. On other strands, the cell produces transfer, or tRNA, and ribosomal, or rRNA. In their final form, these molecules play a vital role in protein synthesis. I hope that animation was useful, but now we'll move on to translation. So after transcription, translation occurs. And what is translation? Well, in translation, we have the mRNA, which is this here. It is left the nucleus and it's gone into the cytoplasm. So here it's in the cytoplasm, which is just the fluid part of the cell. And the reason why is because in the cytoplasm we have our ribosomes. And if you remember from year 11 biology, our ribosomes make proteins. And they make proteins this way that I'm going to describe now. So we're going to have our mRNA, which goes into our ribosomes, and it's going to wait. And what's it going to wait for? It's going to wait for something called tRNA. Now the tRNA are they called tRNA? tRNA stands for transfer RNA. So T stands for transfer. And RNA is just RNA. So it's, what they have is they have a something, something called an anticodon. So we call this an anticodon. 
and this is three bases, which are the opposite of this here. Remember, we said in the last video that we always have three letters coding for one amino acid. So this is a codon, and these are three letters which code for one amino acid. And this is the anticodon. The anticodon has to be the opposite of the codon for it to work. So what happens, so for example, let's say we take this transfer RNA, and it will try to fit onto here. All right, so we'll try to fit onto here. But now the codon, this is actually identical, right? AUG and AUG are identical. The codon is identical to the anticodon, and it doesn't work, it doesn't fit. But what does fit is if we have U, so opposite of A is U, so we have to have a U somewhere, this one or this one. The opposite of U is A, and the opposite of G is C. So if we have this one, the anticodon fits on the codon because it's the opposite. And what will happen is it will stay there, and then the next one moves in. Right, so now we have one amino acid being fixed, and now we need to look for the opposite of A, G, C, this codon here. Remember, triplets always have triplets that code for something, these three. So we have U, C, G, A, G, C. Yep, that's the exact opposite. So these are the exact opposite. So the anticodon is opposite of the codon which means that fits. What happens now is we will have these two being released. So we have these amino acids being released, and they will bond together. And these transfer RNAs will actually move, move away again to make space for the next one. Right? So these will move, and now we have these amino acids bonded together. And the actual codons will move. So the mRNA in a second, you'll see them move on just to make room for the next one. So this will be waiting there, and it's waiting for the next amino acid. So now we've had a couple already coded, the first two were coded, and now the next one, last one, moves into place. Sure, take that, move it. Oops. But yeah, you know, you know what I didn't want to grab the other one. But, uh, but yeah, now it's the last one, so we need one more. So which one is the one that will fit into the last one? UAC, opposite, so the anticodon of UAC would be AUG. So this one here, this one fits. This one fits perfectly. It's the opposite, right? And same thing, you'd have the codon, the anticodon and the transfer in RNA after it's done its job will leave. And then the transfer, this part here will bind to the chain. And this will go on and on and on. It will become bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? So yeah, the, here, this is called translation because it's translating this code. It's translating this code to make an actual amino acid. So you can see here the same process. We have the chain itself, which is growing longer and longer and longer until all the mRNA is read. And that can be a lot of amino acids. And I'm going to show you a quick video about the same idea again. And then I'm going to wrap it up. Translation begins with the binding of a messenger RNA to a small subunit of a ribosome, the cell's workbench for protein assembly. When properly positioned, the messenger RNA triggers the approach of a tRNA, which carries the first amino acid. The tRNA attaches only if its three nucleotides exactly match the first three coding nucleotides of the mRNA strand. A large ribosomal subunit now joins the group to form a functional ribosome with two binding sites built from ribosomal proteins and rRNA. Soon, another tRNA arrives, which matches the next three nucleotides on the strand. With the help of the ribosome and some cellular energy, the neighboring amino acids bond together. The first amino acid then separates from its RNA taxi, leaving the ribosome in search of another, identical amino acid. Now the ribosome moves along the mRNA strand. This exposes the next set of nucleotides, which match those of another tRNA. With each amino acid, the protein continues to elongate. As it grows, it folds into the three-dimensional shape so crucial to its function. 
When the process is complete, the ribosomal fragments separate, free to join again later. With a legion of these molecules in operation, a single cell can produce hundreds of proteins every second. So for this dot point, again, a very do important dot point, what you should know is you should know about transcription translation. You should know that trans transcription happens in the actual uh, nucleus inside the cell. Translation happens in the cytoplasm. Transcription is where we make a copy of the gene itself. This would have been the gene here. We make a copy, which we make on mRNA. Mess mRNA. And the good thing about mRNA is it can actually leave the nucleus. DNA can't leave the nucleus, but mRNA can't, can leave the nucleus. So now it has made a copy. And that was transcription. But then it leaves the actual nucleus and it goes to ribosome where the code on the gene will be translated into an amino acid chain. And it will grow into a long chain. And by the end, we'll have a polypeptide chain, which we can either be, can either directly be a protein or it can combine with different types of amino acid, uh, polypeptide chains to make an even bigger protein. That's the gist of this dot point. And hopefully you got a gist of it. Um, but if you don't understand it in this video, in the next couple of videos, let me know and I'll make a new one. Thank you for watching.